Joel Solomon and Molly Sin. Welcome to Jewish Money Matters. I'm so excited to dive into this topic, Infinite Love of Money, the, the, the title and the theme of your new, latest book. Thank you. Thank, thank you for having us, Yale. It's great to be here. We're really excited. Yeah, I mean, I'm all about this title. It's just, I mean, whoa, Infinite Love of Money, two things that both both of you agree and I agree are infinite, right? But for so many people, it comes laden with this feeling of scarcity of no, I can't find the love of my life, or it just never works out with people and there's not enough money and it doesn't work out with money. It's like this scarcity in these two types of relationships where we know it's, it's abundant, right? So this is a very interesting topic and marriage and money is, you know, one of the most uh, hot topics out there. So congratulations on tackling the, the topic. I want to get started with the why behind this, because Molly, um, you similar to, you know, you have an MBA, you are on your doctorate on organizational leadership. Yep. Maybe you're not as technical as our friend Joel, but you definitely <laughs> come from a more traditional technical world, right? And here you both are, I know, very empathetic human beings, very intuitive, um, not with a background in the psychology or the spirituality of, you know, relationships or a relationship with money. And yet you're wanting to help in this area. You know that here's where much of the pain point lies and much of the transformation actually lies um, before we even get to the habits and the practical stuff and the technical stuff. So what I suspect that behind all this, there has to be a really um, powerful personal drive, probably different, maybe in some ways similar for both of you. So why don't we get started with that? Let's start with Molly. What's your why behind writing a book about love and money? So uh, that's a great question. Uh, my why is, is it is, it's just deeply personal. I, and I'm happy to share it. I share it in the book as well. Um, my why is that I've been down this road. I've done it wrong. I've had the fights about money. I've had the misunderstandings, the, the non-conversations or the conversations that never happened that should have happened. I've had those things um, and I've done it wrong. I've done it wrong over and over again. And so before I found my husband, my current husband, I dived really deep into understanding relationships. And at the same time, I was on a similar path that I wanted to also find um, my spiritual, my connection to spirituality. And that's where I found Mike Dooley and his book, Infinite Possibilities. And um, I, I started to really um, follow him and, and understand that my life was infinite as well. But I also followed... Um, I started to really study John Gottman. Uh, Dr. John Gottman does a love lab that's a 40 year, I think now it's 45 years in the making where they test the physiological responses um, it, it, from blood to urine to blood pressure, all of it to see how couples uh, interact and repair from, from disagreements or unfortunate incidents as they say, and how well they repair. And so I wanted to be, he calls them masters and disasters. And I've been in the disaster field and I wanted to learn how to master a relationship. Mm. And so I did, and I made a very solid commitment. My husband and I have made a very solid commitment to each other to be masters or to learn to be masters because you don't learn these things. You don't learn how to be in a relationship anywhere in school or even at home. What you learn is how your parents figured it out. You don't learn how to be in a relationship. And so my husband and I really dedicated ourselves to do that. And um, I wanted to, for lack, for maybe pun intended, marry the two, the spirituality and the love connection. And then Joel came to me and said, hey, what about marrying it to money? And I said, oh my God, that's brilliant. So hats off to Joel for the idea because that was just brilliant. 
Yeah. And like, and you, like you said, nobody teaches us about relationships, yeah. about intimate relationships. We just model what we saw our parents do. And hopefully if we're wise enough, we try to repair, we try to do things better, right? right? It takes tremendous self-awareness, tremendous work. And the same goes with money, right? Yes. Nobody teaches us about money, not the practical, not the psychological, not the spiritual, none of it. We right. just model what we saw. So spot on. Now, what about you, Joel? What was, what was going on in your life that you said, I got to tackle marriage and money? So I actually was jogging one day which I do every day. And this particular morning, a few years ago, I, it, it just hit me that Molly and I needed to work together. She, I knew her through Mike Dooley as a certified infinite possibilities trainer and trailblazer as I am. And we met through Mike Dooley, through his teachings. And I realized that we needed to work together because the number one reason why, or the number two reason why relationships end is money. Yep. And I knew Molly as a master relationship and, and couples coach, we could help those couples who were struggling and not communicating well around money. And what had happened just a few days before is one of my clients had come to me and we were, I was working with him for a while uh, around actually helping him get a new job because he was, his compensation had been going down every year. And so we are working on visualizing and, and thinking about how he can live his dream life and get his dream job. And it kept on coming back to money. And we started do, playing the budget game, which is in the book, by the way. And he we were going to play the budget game. We, we sat down. I said, you know, it's, it's time for your wife to get involved in this mm. discussion. And he said to me, no, she doesn't need to be involved. I handle everything related to money. And it just hit me that this is not a good way for a couple to, to communicate about money, lack, you know, the lack of communication and, and they weren't making decisions jointly. And I realized there was a better way and Molly and I could teach the better way to do that. And so this book, I believe, teaches couples how to communicate better, how to do these exercises together because we have exercises throughout the book on how to communicate better and on all different types of situations so that they can come back together in love. I love that what you just said. It's so typical, Joel, right? We see it so often. I see it in my work. One of the partners does not want to get involved, hasn't ever gotten involved. There is like this imbalance of power. Um, maybe power is not the word, but of, of, of understanding, of control, right? And some people don't even want to, don't want to rock the boat. They don't want that change. They don't even know that why it would be good for them. They know it's in uncomfortable on some level. And very often, even for the person who actually has more control in the relationship, very often I've found that they wish they didn't have to have all the decision-making power. So how do we get couples to understand what the three of us know, which is it's so much better for the relationship when you both have decision-making abilities, when you're both in the loop, when you've both agreed on what needs to be done, who's going to do it and how, instead of one person dominating? That's a great question. I, I mean, Joel, if you don't mind, I can take part of it. Maybe you want to jump in. Um, I think that if you look at, so as you were asking me the question, what co comes to mind is, um, is, is a, a stool. The strongest stools have three legs because it provides balance, right? So if you only have one of those holding up the stool, one stick or one leg holding up the stool, you're not going to have balance anywhere. And it's always going to be like, it, it'll teeter, if you will, mm -hmm. if you can see my hand gesture. But if you have two, or it balances much better. 
But when you have three, you have you, me, and our decision. That's the three-legged stool that we're looking for. We're looking to say, okay, this is the better way to do it. Now we give ways to do it. Maybe some person's gonna take the primary role and that's okay. In my relationship with my husband and I, I take the primary role. But there's a certain limit to where, you know, a dollar spend where I'll say, okay, let's talk about this. I'm going to, this is what I want to do. Friend needed something, needed emergency surgery. I want to give her $500. What do you think about that? Yes, absolutely. Or maybe no, let's scale back and give a little less. Or you know what? She's a really good friend. Let's give her a little bit more. Though That makes our decision stronger and makes the stool that much stronger. Yeah. Love that. Love that. Love that analogy. Joe, what do you say? Anything? Yeah, I I agree completely. And I I'd say it just eliminates the possibility of surprises, right? You just, if you're, if you're both coming, you're have an open discussion, have open communication, there can't be a surprise or the potential for a disagreement in the future. If you're just open and honest and having that communication throughout the relationship, and it should be in all aspects of the relationship, not just about money. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think ultimately what we're trying to convince people is that their relationship is going to be so much stronger, right? That connection is so much, it's going to be so much stronger. Yes. It might be uncomfortable to get to the other side, but all areas of growth require discomfort. Right. And so, you know, and, and when Molly, when you were saying about the, you know, you, me, our, right. It, kind of brought me to this idea, which I know you address in the book of the personality types, right? We both come into the relationship with different personality types made up of this different money story, everything we've learned and observed and experienced around money, right? And more often than not, we don't know our partner's personality, money personality type. And I find that often we don't even know ours, to be quite frank. This is not something that we ponder too much about until we're in crisis and we really have to do this work, right? So when we, why don't, what I I would love for you guys to do, since you've written about this extensively, why don't you shed some light um, for listeners about what the different money personality types are, and then also how can we increase the chances of success in the relationship when we become so much more self-aware of what they are and of our partners? So Joel, I'm going to let you take this, but I would like to say that the money personalities can shift. And we do talk about that as well. And they, we've written them to be very two-dimensional because we want to catch your attention with, with the personality types. Mm. But they're fluid as everything is, and we can change and grow. And we do give the antidotes and the the suggestions as well. But Joel does this really well. So I'm going to let Joel take it. Great Thanks, point. Molly. And that's a great point to understand that in different circumstances, at different ages, you can be a different money personality type. Hmm. Very important to understand. And so we actually recommend in the book, we have a survey in the book, in the appendix, and we recommend you do it each three to six months to find out how it might shift over time as you become more self-aware. Wow. And, and if people actually, if listeners want the money personality type survey, uh, if they text to the number 66866-ILM for infinite love and money, they'll, and put in their email, they'll get the money personality type survey. So, so the acronym is SUGA PI. SUGA PI. Okay. So S stands for splurgers. U for the unconscious type, G for the greedy ones, A for the accumulators, P for the protectionists, I for the investor type, and E for the ego type. Hmm. So I'll go through each of them very high level, but we can get into more detail. So the, the splurger type, they, their mindset, they have thoughts of entitlement, right? They, their attitude is actually one of desperation and they're swayed easily swayed by emotions mm. usually and cost they're you know for them cost is inconsequential so that sounds like a splurger. teenager <laughs> <laughs> and 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 some older people do 
Uh, the you is the unconscious one. And as it uh, is, is pretty obvious, right? These type of people, they are unconscious. They don't take any action steps. You know, for them, action, you ask them what action, no action, right? So they, they don't want to deal with the consequences of what's right in front of them. Mm. They have their head in the sand, right? And again, as Molly said, each of these, we're being provocative right? You know, this is not just two dimensional, there's many dimensions, but in order to, to make it a little bit more provocative, we, th this is the names that we've given them. So the G, the greedy type, right? That obviously, their focus is just on the money. Um, they negotiate harshly. Uh, they tend to have actually a poverty conscious mindset. Mm. And they're scared to do without. So that's the S-U-G-A is the accumulated type, also known as the savers. And, and some may say, oh, that's great. Those, that must be the best type. But again, if you're only one, you're not, you not have balance, that's not good either. So just saving. If you're just saving, you're not actually letting money flow, mm -hmm. right? You're, you're hoarding. You're not, you're not putting that money out into the universe. And we say money is just energy. And by putting that flow out, it must flow back to you. So the accumulator, right? Safety and security is really of paramount importance to them. P, protectionist type is even, even more on the, on the scale of the saver, right? It's that they're not even going to put their money in the bank, right? They'll put it under the mattress. They're really protecting it. They're making sure that nothing will ever happen. So there's no risk, you know, the stock market goes down, the real estate market goes down, they've taken no risks. Well, the risk they have taken is inflation risk, mm -hmm. right? Because money does, isn't stagnant, you know, even at three, three and a half percent interest rate, inflation rate, you know, your money is worth half in 20 years. So that's the risk they're taking. The protection is, feels like they're taking no risk, but they're actually taking a lot of risk. I is the investor type. Right. They they're looking at things from a point of view of how can I make that? How can I invest 80 cents and make 100 percent, 100, 100 cent return? Right. Um, they tend to be confident in their investments and they'll spend money to make money. Now, the egotist is type is even more on that scale of they, they're overconfident. Right. They're overconfident that no matter what they put their money in, they're going to make money. So they're ego driven, right? Mm. And you know they believe they always have the best financial plans. They won't listen to their spouse or their partner about what else potential is out there. They have the best ideas no matter what. So they're not gonna compromise. And if I may, one of the reasons that we are provocative is that we realize that so many of, so, so much of this personality type is comes from our so some trigger or something that's happened in our past. Yes. And so we're protection, we're protecting because we've lived through something terrible or we're egotistical because we think we've won somewhere really well. And so it, it becomes this one focal point that, that drives it. But again, in finding balance, this is what we're looking for, finding balance within ourselves and finding balance with our partner. Hmm. And, and to be clear, in the book, we state that each money personality type has a benefit. And then we also say that each money personality type can be shifted. Our proposal is how to lessen that particular strong trait that you have to compromise to one of the other traits. So if you're a splurger, may make sense to you think about how you can save more. And if you're a saver, how can you actually splurge, right, more? So it's all about the balance. Mm -hmm. And especially in the dance of our relationship, right? Like if your wife, let's say, although this is kind of like stereotyping it, the conversation, but let's say, let's say he or she has more of a saver or accumulator dominant tendency and has a need for safety and the other partner this dominant personality is a splurger you know that's their background that's their experience that's how they relate to money so then there's this dance in the relationship where maybe if you weren't in this relationship you wouldn't shift 
But because you're in this relationship, one of the beautiful things of the relationship where the growth is, is that because some things are the needs of your spouse, then you can also add this, right? You can also balance within you adding this other facet to your personality that is needed, um, which is going back to what we said initially, right? It's all about growing and, and creating a much more intimate bond between both of us. Right. So this is really interesting, but now what I would like to know is, let's say we get the self-awareness and I know what's my dominant type. I'm even so self-aware that I could tell you exactly where it comes from. You know, what were those triggers at home in my home of origin that kind of made me this way? I'm using air quotes here. Um, and I have a suspicion what my partner is. Now what? How do we start creating the bridge in the relationship? So that's part of what uh, Joel was mentioning. We have exercises in at the end of each chapter. And that's what helps the, these exercises help lead you toward that exact thing, finding your bridge together, finding um, in, in a way, making creating shared meaning through these examples and exercises of saying, okay, how do how how do we want to handle this going forward? How do I, um, how do I, for, I'll give you an example. My, my mom, and my dad, my dad was a protectionist. He, to, to a very large degree, he was a protectionist and my mom was a splurger. And so how do you find that common ground? How do you work with each other? And the way my, my parents worked with each other was my dad handled the, all of the bills, did everything and set aside. There was a certain amount of money that my mom was, you know, had a budget every month for her to splurge on, for her to do whatever. Now, you know, it can seem misogynistic saying, oh, she got an allowance or she can say, no, no, this is my splurge fund, which is what mm -hmm. she used as and how she looked at it. And again, it becomes a thing of mindset. Where's your mindset and how are you viewing this? Um, so that's, I think that's really where it is, is, is creating the understanding your long-term goals and creating that shared definition um, of what you want. So we go into the, we go into the, in the book, Yeah, you know, we go into the book, in the book about different scenarios. Mm-hmm. So we actually have specifics. Okay, if this scenario happened, how would you, you know, each answer the question and come together and discuss how you how you would deal with this particular scenario. Now we obviously can't cover every single potential scenario, but at least you get an idea of where each of you are coming from, and then you can come together um, and and discuss it. You know, I'm sure you both have come across people who will say, you know, I'm into this. I, I, I'm ready. I know I. I know something needs to change. I'll read the book. I'll do the exercises. I'll go through the coaching program. I'll, you know, but there's no way I can get my spouse to do it. What do we say to that person? That's a tough one. Um, I, it, it is a really tough one when you have, when you're talking about working on your relationship, what I would say is, look, you buy a car, that car needs maintenance. A relationship needs maintenance. You, your car needs your, you know, how many ever three months, whatever you get your oil change, et cetera. See, I don't know about this because my husband handles it or I wait for the indicator. So I just do it when it tells me to. We don't have an indicator on our relationship though. There's no indicator on that. And both of us in the relationship have to be aware and have to be invested in the relationship to say, okay, this is something we're going to do. This, this, this is something we're going to stay committed to because we want to. So, and we give suggestions for that. If you're, if you've got someone who's very resistant to it in the beginning, we suggest reading the book, start with the book for yourself and engage in the conversations and the exercises. You can create them into, bring them into conversation with your partner. And as you as you uh, peel back that layer, you can dig a little deeper and peel back that layer and then say, okay, well, why don't we do the book together? 
Yeah, I, I love that. That's also been like my approach. Like, we'll start with you, right? We can't change somebody else. Right. That, that we know for sure. We can start changing ourselves. And ultimately, in a relationship, the more you work on yourself, it's going to trickle into the other person. And we can bring it into conversation, like Molly said, like, hmm, you know, I really just discovered something about my upbringing that I'd never given some thought before. And now I'm realizing I'd love to share with you why when we had that fight last week, I probably reacted that way. And, you know, like just bring it in a non-adversarial way when it's being all about you, right? Like your right. discovery about your, I'm sorry, about the I, I'm discovery about myself, not about the other person. And, you know, it, 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 it revolves around one big word, which is vulnerability, right? It does be willing to be a little or a lot vulnerable with your spouse about an area that is hard, right? That it's emotional. So why don't you talk about, why don't we talk about those emotions now that I brought it before, up, right? Before because, I go on, yeah. Yeah, sorry, Intra I, maybe a little, being a little provocative here, yeah. adding on a little bit more. So if, if one of the partners says, there's no way my spouse is going to do this, I will say that's a limiting belief. And so you can change that limiting belief to an empowering belief that my spouse is open to no ideas and, and use that affirmation mm -hmm. and act in ways that will bring that to reality. I know that in my life, I've had disagreements with other people and I've changed my relationship to them without them changing their relationship at all by just changing my thoughts, my energy, the affirmations I do towards them or for them. And then the energy has shifted. Yeah. And so being a little provocative, how about changing yourself before you change? And, and you touched on that, but I just wanted to put, you know, delve into it a little bit more by working on you, you can work on your own limiting beliefs by saying, hey, maybe my spouse or partner will be open to change over time and start acting as if they are today. Absolutely. I love that you said that, Joel. It is so, so critical. You know, like people rise up to expectations and sometimes we literally just project, right? We, we and I've discovered this in my marriage and in my students, right? my husband is not my father, right? And so very often we treat our husband the way your mother treated your father. Well, guess what? We're just building that same dynamic. We're setting up this man to behave like your father where you can have a completely different script, but it starts with your inner script of, who this person is, is, who this person can be, how they can react, how they can relate to you. So thank you for that insight. I think it's super, super important. It all goes down to that word that you use, that term limiting belief, right? What am I believing that's holding me and my relationship back? Now, we all know that this is super emotionally charged for most people, right? The reason we don't talk about money is because or because whenever we do, we feel very strong emotions and that we just want to run away from that. Why don't we talk a little bit about that emotional charge? Maybe what do we, what can we do about it? So the first thing to do is to recognize where that emotion is coming from. What is the dream behind that emotion? If it's fear, what is the dream behind that fear? Mm -hmm. um, is it, is it a lack of safety? So I want to feel safe. So that, so if we can get to that, then we can have conversations about mm -hmm. this um, because no one wants to make your partner feel unsafe, right? We are all about safety and security in our relationship. And that's what, that's what we're here for. We're here for love and security and, you know, those basic things. Um, I think the things are, there's two emotions, love and fear. And we want our partner to feel loved, not fearful, because anything will, can be derived down to those. So I think that that's the first thing to do. And then to really think back as to what triggered that emotion, what triggered it, how do, and we, again, this is another exercise in our book, what triggered that emotion? How do we talk about this? How do we continue to make it work for both of us, to, for both of us to feel safe and secure and loved? 
Yeah. I, you know, Molly, you just, when you were answering that question has brought me to, you know, like the, an example that we see, see so often, right. You're feeling lack of safety, for example, but you're not communicating that you're just behaving in a certain way that your partner interprets as she doesn't trust me or I'm in, she thinks I'm incompetent or he again. Um, and so again, that friction is built, but it really, none of that needed to happen. If we're able to really get honest about what is the feeling, what is the emotional need that I have? And can I actually articulate it more, more often than not, like you said, your partner is going to be receptive to that because our partner wants the best for us. We want to be in it together. Yep. Yeah, in, in, sorry, go ahead, Joel. Yeah, sorry, Molly. So in, in the book, we actually have a chapter called emotional scenarios. And then, so we go through a particular scenario and say, okay, so what is, this is chapter four. And then we say, okay, so what are the emotions that you feel when you, when you actually go through the scenario? Cause some, you know, you, there's, there's a scenario we have where one uh, partner was supposed to invest some money in a particular investment and they had discussed it. And then when the partner came back and said, so how did it do the part, the other partner had said, well, actually I, I never did it didn't invest the money because because you know the stock market went down 40 percent in march of 2020 and i didn't want to have that happen to this and all that and so then you go through you know the emotions that each felt you know through that scenario so imagine you were one partner or the other how do you feel you know how do you respond to the other person you know so it you know going through these scenarios i think is important to understand you know, your feelings of safety and security and what, what emotions do they bring up for you? Was there open communication in that scenario or not? Um, you know, what would you have told the, the partner in the scenario and so on? So I think it bring, it'll bring up specific instances in your past um, that you can deal with and openly with your partner. Yeah. And I love that the book has all these exercises because, you know, with a few tweaks, you could probably personalize it very quick. Like you're right away, like identify a time when you've been in a similar situation. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and we're trying to get to that place of empathy. Now, moving away from this for a second, um, one of the things where I find that people um, experience so much frustration in a relationship is the lack of understanding of something super practical, which is the way money flows in, in, in our mutual economic system, for lack of a better term, right? The cash flow in the family, right? What money is there? When does it come in? Where is it being channeled? How is it being made? There's a lot of miscommunication and lack of transparency and sometimes lack of organization around it all and the, the timing of it all. And it causes tremendous amount of friction. I'd love for you guys to address why it's so important for people to understand cash flow in order to have these this healthier relationship relationship and relationship with money and with themselves. So it's like the flow of energy. You need flow to happen for a, a river needs to flow in order for it to continue to process. Um, I, again, another example that I'll give you is, is my parents. You can provide very uh, logical answers and, and I think that we actually give this example um, in the book of if you're going to put it into a CD, you're not going to make money. In fact, over time, you will lose money. Uh, but there are still people who are really old school. And like my dad lived through, lived through a couple of uh, the SNL crash, et cetera. And so he was very protectionist about his money. And it was very much, I'm putting it into CDs, CD IRAs, is what he said, which is which is rough. Like it just, I, I, you don't understand it because the math on it, and he was actually a math, he did his master's in math, but the math on it doesn't make sense. So you see how it's so emotional, right? Even a math yes. person right. like him. <laughs> exactly. But the math doesn't make sense. And you couldn't, there was nothing that 
you know, the energy then to take it out was too much. And it just, it stagnates. And when something like that stagnates, you don't, what do you tell anybody? How, how do you explain that? And, and that's where we get into a gridlock situation. Hmm. And then we come back to that, that uh, analogy of a river of water flowing. Well, the, well, when a dam stops the water, there's no, there's no water that flows. And much like that, the energy doesn't flow. And then we, in our relationship and in our financial relationship and in our finances also get dammed up and blocked. Mm. Joel has some great, great uh, insights on this as well. So I'll, I'll turn it over to Joel. Thanks, Molly. And yeah, I completely agree. It's, it, you know, m- you got to put it out there into the universe, right? We, we talked about it earlier with one of the money personality types, right? If, if you're the, it may sound good if you're the accumulator, mm. but if you're just hoarding, you're keeping the money in, you're not putting it out into the universe, there's no flow. Hmm. Right. And so we, I talked about in my second book in the nine money rules, rule number six is giving. And people say, wait a second, you're, you're, you're giving money away. How is that? How is that going to make you wealthier? But, but by putting it out there, by putting it out into the universe, it must flow back to you. And so we just say money is energy, right? Hmm. And, and it's an exchange of energy, right? And so if you're hoarding that energy, there's no flow. Right. And, and, and the other thing um, that is really important to understand is to know you need to know in order to know financial freedom, what your financial freedom is, your number is, you need to know where your cash is going. Yeah. And the way you calculate your financial freedom number is to understand what your expenses are each month. Multiply it by 12. So your expenses are 5000 a month. Multiply by 12. That's $60,000. You would need $1 million earning 6% after tax to be financially free. But if you don't know where your cash is going, you can't know financial freedom. So it's really critical to know where your cash is going. Yeah. And, 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 and again, it causes so much tension, um, especially if we don't ever talk about it. Right. And one just spends and the other just watches the spending and there's not ever a communication of, Hey, um, I wanted to start saving for this goal or, you know, there is some debt being accumulated. Right. And there's just not that seamless understanding of what is happening with the flow. Um, And I just really want to stress to listeners that it's so, so important. Yeah, absolutely. And we, we, in the book on where's your cash going, we have the budget game. What is the budget game? So the budget game, what we want to do is make this four letter word, the budget, a game, because when you gamify anything, it's fun right? You're playing a game, you're playing a card game, you're playing sports, it's fun. So instead of making it difficult and, you know, uh, friction, you're playing the game. And so the, what, the way we describe it is just keep track of your expenses for a day. And if you can do that for a day, maybe try for three days or a week. And then once you've done a week, multiply by four, you have a month. Mm -hmm. And the idea is to use a spreadsheet or use a sheet of paper and to rank your monthly expenses from lowest to highest, actually highest to lowest. And when you get to the lowest amount, which has a balance, so say it's a credit card balance um, with a $20 minimum payment. You haven't been paying off your credit card each month, so you have a balance, it's $20, you double it. Now, it may sound like, wait a second, if I don't have enough money to pay all my expenses, how can I double the last, the smallest one? But what happens when you start playing the game is it's a game and and it just, it, it shifts the energy around money from pressure and scarcity and lack to fun and expectation. And by making that quick shift, you'll find that, and I found in the courses I've taught where we do this, 
that the money starts flowing in from unexpected ways, from unexpected places. And that extra $20 that you put on that small credit card amount, you'll, you'll get in a lot more than the $20. So it's, it's playing this game. It makes it fun. People actually run to their mailbox to find the bill so that they can put it in their spreadsheet to see what the amount is and cross off that you know, balance and make it smaller. And it, it just, it's just, instead of being all this pressure and stress, it becomes a game and it becomes fun. And I guess if we're to, if we're in a relationship, we can make a little challenge for ourselves, right? Together, you know, yeah, uh, you know, how, how fast can we get to the next category, let's say, and add more money to the next category. And, and the idea is once you pay off that smallest amount, you eliminate that column mm -hmm. that has a balance. And over time, it'll, it'll, it'll happen much quicker than you expect. You actually will have a lot less columns, maybe even no columns with balances. In mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we can do the same thing with saving or investing, right? Let's say we're investing 10% of our income, joint income, right? Well, what, how about we try to do 12% and let's see if we can bump it up this month and let's see if we can keep this up for the next two, three, four months. So it's building that those little mini challenges in a more, in a, in a in fun, adding that fun element, yeah. that, which by the way, Joel, we never talked about this, you and I, but I do the same thing with my students where, you know, instead of making it like you have to have this meeting that's like all boring and horrific and laden with tension, let's just start off by calling it a money date, right? Let's call it a date and let's go to our favorite coffee shop or let's find our favorite spot on the couch and our favorite tea and a blanket and the computer, you know, like, like let's try to lower the emotional charge so that we can actually talk. That's a, that's a great, um, that's a great thought. We actually think we write about maybe opening up a glass of wine, you know, bottle of wine that, just to relax the emotions and to, and to really get on the same page with each other. And if you start first with what is our dream, then you can funnel towards how do we get to that dream? What is our dream? We, you know, you, pl we play the, the understand our financial freedom number, as Joel mentioned, then once we figure out our financial freedom number, how do we get to that financial freedom number? How do we lower our bills through the budget game? How do we, how do we get there? And then it, and then it becomes also, uh, uh, as we talked about before, that third leg, the we in this mm -hmm. scenario. How, and it becomes that third leg on the stool where we are an even stronger stool because now we are working together towards what it is. And it, it does, again, when you realize it's we and not you spent this and you spent that and you splurged on this when you should have saved on that you know, we did this risky investment when we, and it takes that out of it. And it really brings it back to we, you and me. Makes me. Yeah. And I'm glad you gave us that reminder, Molly, because very often we come into these quote unquote dates, if you will, but we're already like, okay, let's, let me talk to him or her about the credit card. Or let me talk about the fact that we didn't invest in what we said we're going to invest. How about we start off the process with Let's talk about the dream. Let's talk yeah. about the values. Let's talk about the why, right? Before we even tackle the numbers, there has to be this very powerful why and understanding that is really going to be the foundation for all of it. Right. Exactly. That's, that's, that's just this. Sorry, go ahead, Joel. No, it's exactly right. I was just going to add on, Molly. It's the, you know, it's the, you know, having the joint dream because you have individual dreams, but having the joint dream together as a couple, right? That that makes you come together. Starting from that point, then you can, you know, for me, like uh, former Toastmaster, we talk about you know, the sandwich technique of something positive, some improvement opportunity, something positive. So starting with the, the positive, the joint dream, and then you can get into, okay, how can we improve to get to that dream? Hmm. That's a great way to have the discussion, I think. What happens when I get this question often, what happens when the dream just does not coincide? So, so if we're talking about individual dreams, then we're talking about how to support each other within those dreams. So um, I actually, I'm glad you brought this up. My husband and I were just actually talking about this. Um, we have a 
a um, ritual where we share our gratitudes and intentions for the day. And, and in my gratitude today, I don't know how it came up. I was just like, you know, you do the craziest things with me. We, I say, let's go on some 80 mile walking hike and, you know, to do part of the Camino in Spain and you say, okay, let's go. And you planned it even, or, you know, I, I say, Hey, let's get matching tattoos and you do it. <laughs> just, just crazy. But he goes on these adventures with me and, and for him, he says, well, yes, but that's part of the fun, right? Mm-hmm. We do this together. Now there are some things that he'll say, no, 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 honey, that is all you have fun. <laughs> And there are things that he'll do that, that he just, I'll just say, you know what, have fun. And that's it. That's the honoring of the individual and the coming together as the we. Mm -hmm. That's why the stool is three pronged, right? You have to honor the, the he, the me and the we. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I find that when we come, when we get to understand what is important to our partner, Mm -hmm. you know, even if it never would have been important to you, it never would have been but because of the we, because of the strength of the relationship, and again, because of the empathy, where is that need coming from? Oh, it's because it's this beautiful aspect of their personality that I value yeah. so much. Therefore, it translates in them wanting to finance these experiences or these things. Then I'm more inclined to go with it, right? And instead right. of completely opposed. And I can absolutely support his dream to, you know, run a marathon from the couch and applaud him and even go down there. (laughs) And he can support my desire to maybe, you know, I don't know, do something equally crazy, but from, we don't have to do everything together. That is the beauty of a relationship is that we have our differences and we can come back together and reunite and say, okay, but we find ways to support each other in our individual dreams and have joint ones together. In fact, we talk about this in one of the chapters, the the dream chapter, what are our dreams? So we do talk about having individual dreams and having joint dreams. You used to be, sorry, I was going to say all that that's what creates the infinite love. Right. Bingo. Because you're, you, you're both, you know, you're coming together to support each other's dreams to you. You're both here. You're raising each other up and you're coming together with, with love to create infinite love. Bingo. Beautifully said. You used a a word that is so critical here and often overlooked that gratitude element and even that celebration, right? Starting those conversations also, whether we have them once a week, once a month, whenever we do have them, and hopefully they're intentional conversations and not just fights in the middle of your work day, right? Um, And those intentional conversations with the things we're grateful for and the things that we celebrate. Yes, even the fact that we're having this date or, you know, the fact that we did set this intention and we, we paid off this thing or we started saving for that thing, those tiny little things that we could start being grateful and communicating that gratitude and that appreciation towards each other really builds a stronger foundation for it all. It does. In fact, um, it also builds um, better feelings and it raises our vibration. And and when we have higher vibration toward it, we have better feelings towards everything else. And it, we, it's enforces us to do it again and again. Right. Yeah. It just, it fosters a much stronger bond. Yeah, yeah, Molly brings up an important point because, you know, on the emotional guidance scale, right, appreciation and gratitude are number one. Yes. Right. It's, it's right there with happiness and ecstasy and passion. So when you're grateful and appreciative, you're raising the vibe of the whole entity, both you and your partner, and it, it just elevates the whole relationship. Absolutely. Absolutely. I often get a question and I wonder what you guys think about this. People very often ask, well, which one is better having joint finances, separate finances, or a combination of both as though there was a one magic answer to this. You've heard this before. Yeah. I don't think there is a right answer to it. I'm going to say, um, Joel's a financial person, but I can tell you emotionally in terms of a relationship and in terms of your love, whatever works for the both of you is what's great. Uh, I'll, I'll, my husband and I are joint. 100% agree with what Molly said. Be, you know, it reminds me of when I was at this conference uh, 
And the reason why I became a prosperity coach, there was a guy at this conference, a guest speaker, and he was pitching stock options to 200 people as the way to get rich. Hmm. And there's no, and, and, and people were tapping me on the shoulder. They were screaming, my ear, Joel, does this make sense? And look, there's 200 people in the room after he was done, we went outside and I said, look, you know, for one or two or five of you, this may make sense. But in general, he has no idea about your earnings or cash flow or risk tolerance or tax status. So the same thing here, I think it depends on the couple and the personalities. And there's no one right answer. I, I in both, I've been divorced twice. And in both of those relationships, we had joint accounts and we had an individual account so that, you know, we could splurge on the other. If we wanted to, you know, take them to that um, dream vacation, we didn't really want them to know exactly how much we were spending. But, you know, the main monies go, went into a joint account, say, you know, 80% of the combined comp you know, compensation. Uh, but that, that was, that's my experience. But I would say it depends on each couple and have the discussion and what feels right in terms of safety and security and all the other issues that matter for you. Yeah, I think, I mean, I'll tell you while we have a joint account, my husband likes to buy me flowers. And I think maybe once or twice, I've found the charge before the flowers have come. <laughs> but it's okay. Like the first time I, I, I saw it, I was a little surprised and taken aback at how much he spends on flowers for me. But, you know, it's within budget. So who am I to say anything? Right. Right, right, right. I, 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 I'm not the. I have the feeling that what's important here is the transparency, right? Like, yeah. the the we made this decision together, and we're okay. It's not like I'm hiding something from you. Like, this is we're building something together. We're being completely transparent with each other. However, this system works best, and I agree. Like, for some people, they need to have a joint account and two separate accounts. Some people need to be completely joined. I'm of the joint. Um, camp, but that doesn't mean that there is not another alternative. And I feel like as long as there's communication and transparency, and we're all both in the same boat, and we both have decision making abilities, then if whatever works for you, right? Yeah. Now, and it's just important to have open communication, as you said, in transparency, you need to know that, you know, if, if you're spending a large amount, you communicate with your spouse or partner, so that you know, there's money in the account to to spend that amount. Exactly, which goes back to that cash flow, right? We gotta understand. <laughs> exactly, <that. laughs> it, it does become a circular conversation. All of this becomes a very circular conversation, which is why we call it infinite. There you go. There you go. Now, are there any red flags that you would say? You know what? This is if you're in a marriage, if you're in a formal relationship. And these things are happening. These are big red flags that you just need help, like a serious help. Sure. Anything about hiding, whether any, any level of hiding um, that you're doing, unless of course, as Joel mentioned, it's for a surprise. Um, I think any level of hiding is going to be a pretty big red flag. Um, you know, this, um, of course, we're not talking about, yeah, in my previous book, Infinite Love and Money, I, I, excuse me, Infinitely Loving, I, I do talk a little bit about abuse and say that, that those are things that cannot be fixed by, uh, you know, a book <laughs> you need to go to therapy for. So outside of the, the tragic things, um, you know, I, I would say if you're hiding something, um, we do talk, a little, we touch a little bit about um, financial infidelity. And that is about hiding what you're spending on, even if it's something really small, like, oh, you know, I just, I, I played a game and, uh, uh, you know, some of the games are on your phone or you have to pay for certain things and it, it, you keep paying for it and you don't talk to your husband and it, or partner and it's not within budget. Th that's a hiding thing. And if you don't, if you're hiding something, um, as you mentioned earlier, Yale, if you're hiding something, if you're not transparent, that's a red flag. Yeah. That's definitely a red flag. And you should be able to come back and say, look, this is what I've done. I, I'm so sorry. This is what I've done and find a way to repair from that. Yeah. Now, what about when we're dating? Um, what do you guys think? What can we be doing better before formalizing a relationship during the dating process so that we're actually setting ourselves 
our lives up for this infinite love and infinite money? Well, you could do a coaching session with the both of us. You can <laughs> read this book. This is the hope. I mean, this book, we've written the book so that it works for new couples, for long-term couples. Um, but, you know, the hope is, is that you, is that you do have some conversations. They're not easy conversations to have, but that you're clear, as clear as you are as to whether or not you're going to have children, mm -hmm. that you know what your financial goals and dreams are. That's, that's just going to be vital for any relationship that you know that before you walk down, before you even start to plan for the wedding. Because of course, at some point, you're going to have to talk about who's budgeting for the wedding, which we also touch on in the book, um, how to budget for a wedding or how to consider that. Yeah, we actually have a whole section in in the book on how to budget for wedding, what the normal expenses are. Uh, to to follow on to Molly's answer, I think it's also have the open communication from the start, even on the early dates. You know, who's what is each partner expecting in terms of paying for dates, paying for larger items, paying for vacations paying for the wedding, you know, is it, are you, is, are each of you paying for it? Is the parents paying for it? Um, how much are you willing to spend? How about retirement? How about, you know, what's your dream retirement look like, you know, coming together and having that discussion. How about retirement versus when you have kids, should you be fully funding your kids college and not funding retirement, doing a little bit of both, like having all those discussions early on, as opposed to waiting to when you have kids and then, oh, but my philosophy is this because this is how my parents did it. We do have a chapter called Your Kid's Money. So, and we, we advise readers to read that chapter even if you don't have kids yet, to have the discussion because when you do, you'll have a better place to come from and have, it, and have agreements on. Yeah, you just reminded me that I wanted to touch upon kids, um, a particular question that I have about, about having children. But before I do that, Joel, um, what insights do you have as to going back to the pre tying the knot conversations, being open about not just who gets to do what, who's going to be paying for what, but what our current financial picture is at the moment? Yeah, no, I think that's really important too. Early, you know, before you're married in the early dating situation to, you know, as it were, open the kimono. And, and I remember with, with both of my former wives, we had a very open discussion pretty early on. I even had it with one woman I didn't actually get married to, but we had an open discussion about what our finances were, what net worth is, what the salaries were, just to be open and honest to each other about, you know, the the mix, you know, what percent, you know, if you look at the total compensation after tax, how much, what percent was mine, what percent was hers. But I think it's important to have that discussion. I would, I would gather and expect that most people don't, um, but it's important to understand it, I think, to have, again, to have the open communication to see where there could be the differences lie, not conflicts, but where the differences may lie so that you can come back together in love. I will say that our book, there is a story that goes through the um, and precedes many of the chapters and it's little snippets of a story that is everything of how to do it wrong. Uh -huh. <laughs> everything that wasn't done right uh, in terms of a financial relationship. And, and it starts off with the couple in, in divorce proceedings in, um, and, and it's actually my story with my ex-husband. So I've done it completely wrong uh, where I haven't had the conversation. And, and the hope uh, that I had with sharing this, uh, this story was that you see that everyone, even the people writing the book are human. We've had our mistakes and we've learned from them and we're hoping to help people through that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah, it's, it's so important that the, you know, there's again, going back to the emotions. Yes. It's, it's uncomfortable. Yes. There are emotions, but again, if we really want to build a relationship where there's infinite love and there's infinite money, we have to start getting uncomfortable and we have to build it on open communication and transparency. And it might be that your financial pictures are not exact, uh, you know, 
are not exactly what you expected about each other. And so this is an opportunity to then work through whatever that brings up. And that doesn't mean that the relationship is doomed from the start. It just means let's start working earlier rather than later when life gets a lot more complex. That's right. And talking about complexity, kids bring a layer of complexity into the picture as much as they are a blessing. And here's my question. Um, The blessing of parenting. Very often we get to a place in our marriage where we're ready to do, we've read your book. We're ready to do the work. We're in fact, we're starting to shift things. We're starting to communicate. We're starting to make better decisions, becoming more intentional. However, we up to a certain point, we've raised our children in a certain way. And so very often I see that as much as we want to change when it comes to now shifting the family dynamic, when it involves the children and what we allow or won't allow and how we communicate that to the children, there's an added pressure, an added layer of resistance that often holds the parents back from continuing on this trajectory. So how do we navigate that? That's a great question. <laughs> um, I think that we all uh, deal with it. It's, it. It is a situation of practice uh, and practice and practice. And um, one of the things that, uh, you know, that we suggest is to have that, that weekly conversation or that monthly conversation, bi-weekly, whatever it is that you, wherever it is that you have that touch point of having the conversation. Early on, we talked about one person maybe taking lead, but the second person being in on the conversations and being made aware of what's happening, either bi-weekly, monthly, or week, whatever works for anyone is what we suggest seeing that level of involvement. But that's where we can add in the are we really doing what we want to be doing with our kids? Are we, is this really, so you can almost nip it right and right at the first time, right? If you're doing it weekly or even at whatever your frequency is, we suggest a minimum of once a month. So at that point, if there is a discretion where we have given without talking. Well, again, that goes back to, okay, let's have this conversation and apologize and move forward from it. But if it's something that continues to happen, that's where we can, where our partner who isn't handling the finances can pull back or who isn't doing the digression can pull back and say, let's revisit what we're doing here. Mm -hmm. And then to have the open dialogue about it and decide, maybe you're going to change your mind, whatever works best for you in the situation, depending on what the situation is, or this is where we draw the line. And again, it goes back to that stool analogy where it's me, you, me, and we, because we have to present to the children. It's not, I'm the good cop, you're the bad cop. We are presenting. I think the other point to add on to Molly, what, what Molly said is understand how you were brought up as kids and you, your individual perspective, because you weren't brought up the same way. Right. Maybe one of you were brought up with an allowance, the other wasn't. Maybe one of you, both of you were brought up with allowance, but one had to do chores and the other didn't. You know, so you both come into the relationship with different perspectives. So have the discussion before you have kids about your perspective on how you would deal with certain situations, allowances, paying for things. What if you know, you, you know, one of the spouses hasn't been home for a week. Mm-hmm. Is it okay to come home with a nice present for each of the kids or not? You know, is it, the, is it, that supposed to, that supposed to appease the situation that, you know, you feel guilty about not being around, you know, what, what kind of messages are you sending? So having all those discussions, I think is important before or when they're young and how about the discussions around money in front of the kids? What are you allowed to say? What, what have an agreement? You know, are we allowed to discuss cash flow? Should we discuss our financial situation? Does it matter if there are three year olds, a three year old or 13? You know, I, I think you should, there's more information that you disclose as the kids get older about your money situation. But if the other spouse or the partner doesn't agree, then have the discussion first before you get into that situation. So yeah. we go through a lot of this, a lot of these conversations in your kids money chapter 13 in the book. Yeah. You know what you guys just reminded me, like, you know, this, 
organization, in this case, this family is as strong as the leaders, right? And if we are a we and we're leading this ship a certain direction, you know, even if it's hard sometimes that we're going to change the way we've been doing things up until now, if it's hard to have those conversations and also um, implement on whatever the new boundaries might be, if we're a stronger, we're together doing it, it, our chances of success are much higher. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. There, and, and also the communication, how, what are you saying around the kids? Like I grew up, we can't afford that. Money isn't growing trees. That's too expensive. You know, if I left the light on in my room, we left the house, my dad would scream at me. We're not a shareholder of Long Island Lighting Company. Shut that off. So what messages are you sending your kids as you talk to them in this limiting scarcity, poverty conscious way? You know, I now talk to my kids and say, you know, if they'll, you know, we have in the book, a, a, a story that I, the true story, about buying a sweatshirt for my daughter, Lauren. And, you know, it was $55, which at, I thought it was a fair amount to spend on a sweatshirt. So you have a choice. You could say, that's too expensive, sorry, no. Or you could say, you know what? Why don't you contribute? You know, you're 16 years old, you're making money. Why don't you contribute? you know, 20 or $30 towards that and I'll pay the rest. Or you could just say, this is not a priority for me right now. And you pay the whole thing. So there's many ways to go about any type of discussion. And each of those is sending a message to your children about money. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think the key, the key here is not to shy away from having these conversations because they're learning about money, whether you're doing it openly with them or not. So it's about the intentionality that you put into it. Are you being intentional and then, uh, you know, receiving certain messages or just, you're just letting it, you know, letting, let, let, letting them at their level absorb whatever message their childish brain can absorb. Um, so it goes back to the transparency, right? And what kind of transparency do I want to have and clarity with my children to, to, to mold them in this area? Molly Seen, Joel Salomon, wonderful work. Really, really excited to get my hands on this book. Tell listeners where they can find the book and where they can be in touch with you. So they can find it on Amazon. We are on Amazon, uh, Infinite Love and Money. We are also, I think Joel's selling it on his website. You can get in touch with me at Molly Singh. Dot com molly at molly sing m-o-l-l-i-e-s-i-n-g-h um through the website or my email address and uh joel is also selling the book on his site and i'll let him yeah, my, my site is salamore.com it's named after my daughters lauren and morgan so it's s-a lore more l-a-u-r m-o-r.com and if anyone uh what we're going to do actually is for those of you who who got the money personality type survey. Again, it's text the number 66866-ILM. We're going to randomly choose one of you to get a free infinite love and money uh, signed uh, copy. Um, and again, you can, and you can also get the book uh, on my website. That's solomore.com. Amazing. And we'll make, I'll make sure to put those all on the show notes. And again, I want to just reiterate that texting number. So it's 66866 I L M right. Correct. So super cool. And somebody could get their own free copy signed Molly and Joel. Thank you so much for this wonderful work for tackling an important topic that I'm sure is going to help so many, many in their relationship. Thank you. Thank you so much for having the conversation with us and having us on your podcast. Yeah, we really appreciate it. Thanks. Yale. It's great. Great to be here. Thank you. All right. This was awesome. What'd you got? What did you guys think? How do you feel? I think this is one of the best podcasts we've been on. <laughs> I agree. Great yeah. Great. Really great questions. Yeah. Thought provoking. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was really great. I, I'm not, I'm not just saying it. I, I don't just say things like that, but I think it's the, the best we've been on. So thank good. you. Good. I'm so happy. Very, very good. I'm so happy. So I'll let you guys know it's prob it's scheduled to air, I think next Monday or the following uh, Monday, but I'll shoot you both an email and let you know. Okay. Exciting. Okay. Thank you. Okay. You're in my uh, email tomorrow. I'll put it again for next Tuesday as well. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you guys so much. Okay. Have a wonderful Thanks, week. You too. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.